So we are now in a, in a situation to solve our two-market model, and we'll see that um, that requires a little bit of uh, a little bit of work because now we have two markets with two market tightnesses that interact with each other. Um, so do you remember to uh, <coughs> to solve the model? Uh, essentially, what we need to do is to find a product market tightness X and a labor market tightness theta to solve uh, that satisfy two equations. So one, is that on the uh, product market, it has to be the case that the aggregate demand, which only depends on X, is equal to um, the aggregate supply, which depends on X and on uh, tightness. And then on the labor market, the labor demand, which depends on X and theta, has to be equal to the labor supply, which only depends on um, theta. Um, so that's what we have to solve. Um, and so we need to figure out uh, you know, given the expression of all these curves, uh, so this is just AD is equal to AS, and this is just LD is equal labor demand equal to labor supply. We need to reshuffle this thing to be able to uh, to figure out how to solve. So make sure that this system always has a solution, that the solution is unique, and then given the properties of the solution, we'll be able to do uh, comparative statics. So um, let's see how we can do that and make sure that there is indeed a solution to our, uh, to our model. Um, so let's start with our first equation. Y dx equal to S, uh, x on theta. So y dx um, Right, so we'll have a key epsilon number one plus tau x epsilon minus one mu over p. That's equal to the aggregate supply, which is f of x times a. For x, the probability to sell a uh, is um, technology and then <clears throat> and then this has to be uh, times the number of producers to the power of alpha. Now the number of producer is just the number of employees divided by one plus tau hat of theta. But uh, the number of employees it's also directly given, you know, it has to satisfy uh, the labor supply. So here we can plug in our labor supply directly. So we get F hat of theta times H. So F hat, F hat of theta times H, that's the number of employees, one plus, one plus tau of theta. Once we divide by this, we get the number of producers, and then we put this to the power of alpha. So here we have our first relationship. Um, And then we need a second relationship, and then we'll see how to. So here you can see you, you have x uh, and theta on both sides. So you know it's not exactly clear. Um, it's not exactly clear what you can do with that. But what you can, what's useful is to kind of separate these two things, the so x and the theta. So let's say I keep all my x on one side. So I have f of x one plus tau x epsilon minus one, and then I'll, I'll dump all the parameters and the things that depend on theta on the other side. So I'll have key epsilon mu p a h alpha times uh, one plus tau hat of theta divided by f hat of theta to the power of alpha. Um, OK, so that's the first expression. We'll start that be useful. And then let's look at the second um, thing that has to be satisfied, that labor demand at x and theta is equal to the labor supply at theta. This, that's equivalent to. Um, 
so our labor demand we had said was uh, f of x uh, a alpha divided by the real wage w of p that's the power of one over one minus alpha and then we'll have a one over one plus tau hat of theta that's alpha over one minus alpha that's equal to labor supply which is just f hat of theta times h okay and so um, here's something that's uh, Yes, so here's something that's kind of helpful is to, um, so we can get rid of this, we can put everything to the power of one minus alpha. That's going to simplify a bit. So I'll have f of x here. I put both sides to the power of one minus alpha and I shift all the parameters and the things that depend on theta on the other side. So I'll have, uh, W over P here divided by A, oops, divided by A, divided by alpha, and then I have an H here, then I'll have a F hat of theta here, then I have one plus tau hat of theta to the power of alpha. Right, so this is, uh, this is what we get with our second uh, expression. So, and here, uh, what I forgot is that because I put both sides the power of one minus alpha here, I should have one minus alpha here and one minus alpha here. Okay, so now these are our two key conditions. Uh, once I've kind of reshuffled a bit things around, so that's one and that's two. Okay, so now let's try to um, let's try to see how we can show that there is always a solution to these two equations and that the solution is unique. How are we going to do that? Um, so this equation, let's call it P because it comes from the product market. This one, let's call it L because it comes from the labor market just to keep track of these two things because we're going to use them uh, repeatedly. Okay, so um, let's start with L. What do we learn from L? Well, actually L uh, defines X, the labor market, as a function of parameters and uh, and the, and the labor market tightness. So, because from L, what you can say is that, um, right, you can, re, you can rewrite L, you can rewrite it as X, and I'm going to put uh, uh, L here, because it's the X that's given by equation L, so it's going to be F minus one, so the inverse of our selling probability. So the selling probability, the strictly increasing uh, function of X. So um, it's, you know, it's, it means that it's a, a bijection and so you can invert it. Uh, so it's F minus one, P A alpha, H one minus alpha, F hat theta, one minus alpha, one plus tau hat theta, alpha. Okay, so here we have a first uh, relationship and we can uh, the first relationship that comes out of the system of equations that says that our uh, that the product market in SS has to be equal to a function XL of theta uh, and so What's good is that actually we know exactly the properties of this function XL of theta. So one is that we know that 
So F hat here that's strictly increasing. Tau hat is strictly increasing. These are put to exponents one minus alpha alpha. So that remains strictly increasing theta. F is strictly increasing in X, and so its inverse is also strictly increasing. So what we learn is that XL is uh, strictly increasing in theta. So that's good to know. Um, what happened at zero? Well, when theta equals zero, what's inside uh, f hat of theta is equal zero. So xl of zero is f minus one of zero. So the inverse of zero and the inverse of zero is just zero. Uh, because when the uh, we know that f of zero is equal to zero, so f minus one of zero is also equal to zero. So xl of zero is just zero. And um, so something that we know is that when tightness theta goes to uh, theta m, tau hat of theta goes to infinity. So everything that's inside the bracket here is going to go to infinity. But f, the function f is between zero and one. And so you can't, you know, because the, the, the function f always takes value between zero and one, it means that the inverse of f is defined on zero one. So basically there is a theta that we can call theta L such that um, what's in the brackets here is equal to one. Uh, so basically such that uh, this whole expression at theta L, this is equal to one. And so at this theta L, xl at theta l, it's f minus one of theta l, and it's going to be plus infinity. Uh, sorry, not f minus one of theta l, f minus one of one. Okay, and so we know that this function xl is strictly increasing from zero to infinity when tightness covers, uh, when tightness is between zero and theta l. And what we know is that, of course, theta l is strictly less than theta m. Um, because at theta m, we know that, uh, we know that tau hat of theta m goes to infinity. So we can now plot this first relationship that we've uh, derived here. Okay, so what have we found? So here I'm going to put x, the product market tightness on the vertical axis. I'm going to put theta, the labor market tightness on the horizontal axis. And what we found, the first relationship that x must satisfy, we've said that x is going to be a strictly increasing function. So when we solve the model, we know that x has to be a strictly increasing function x l of theta. It starts at zero, it's strictly increasing, and we know that there's an asymptote. Oops. Um, the asymptote towards plus infinity is obtained at some tightness that we've called uh, theta l, which is strictly less than theta m. Okay, so that's what we figured out uh, for now. Uh, so and this is uh, this is just a graph of the model solution. Okay, so we have only one one relationship, but of course, you know, we have two variables that we've got to figure out what they are. So we need a second relationship. So for that, we're going to work from this uh, equation that we call P that come from the product market. So P as it is, we can't really use it because um, you can see it doesn't give you, it doesn't give you a uh, monotonic relationship between X and theta. The reason being that both tau hat of theta and F hat of theta are strictly increasing. And so their ratio, it's a bit unclear, unclear with PS. And in fact, the ratio we'll see later on in the course is not monotonic. Um, but what we can do is combine P 
and L, these two equations, to get another independent relationship between X and theta that's strictly monotonic. Um, and so in particular, what we can do here is uh, we can take the ratio between P and L, you know, because uh, you know, our model solution, the model says P has to be valid, L has to be valid. But this is equivalent to saying L has to be valid and the ratio on P and L has to be valid. Uh, and uh, what's going to be nice, you'll see that once you take the ratio on P and L, you can see that we'll be able to eliminate this term 1 plus tau of theta to the power of alpha, and therefore we'll be able to get uh, a monotonic relationship between X and theta. So what I said that the model was condition P, condition L, and this is exactly the same as having condition L and P divided by L. Uh, these two things are equivalent, of course. <coughs> um, so you're allowed to re rework your system by taking the ratio of two of the conditions that are going to be true. Um, but now, if we take P divided by L, what do we get? Uh, Uh, well, so on the left hand side, the two f of x are going to cancel out, so I'll just get 1 plus tau x epsilon minus 1, so that's very simple. And that's going to be equal to the ratio of the right hand side, and so on the right hand side, so I'll have this key epsilon mu p a. And have uh, mu p a key epsilon mu p a h alpha. Okay, and then uh, what do I have? Well, I have this. Uh, okay, so I have w over p w over p. Let's see what else comes up here. H1 minus alpha A alpha. So here I have A alpha H1 minus alpha. Oh, sorry, H1 minus alpha is the other. Then I have a H1 minus alpha here. Then, uh, so these are for all the parameters. So key alpha mu p a h alpha w p p h alpha a h okay and then I'll have uh, f hat one minus alpha divided uh, no right I've uh, f hat so I have one plus tau at alpha that's divided by one tau one plus tau at alpha that's going to disappear and then I have f hat minus alpha that's going to be divided by f hat one minus alpha. And so that's going to be one over f hat, uh, one over f hat to the power of theta. All right, so here I have this. So I think that's what you get. So we can simplify this a bit. So here we have p, p that goes out, a, a that goes out. H alpha, H1 minus alpha, so we can get rid of this and get rid of the 1 minus alpha. So here this is uh, nicely simplified, and then uh, so we can rewrite this as tau x is equal to key epsilon mu alpha divided by W H 1 over F hat of theta. Uh, all of this to the power of 1 over epsilon minus 1, which is strictly positive, and then minus 1. Okay, and then, um, so what's good is that tau x on 0 xm is strictly increasing, um, so it's a bijection, so I can invert it, and so now I get that x has to be equal to x that I can call, a function x that I can call x of p, because it comes 
we add a product market dimension of theta, and that's going to be xp of theta is going to be uh, tau minus one of this t epsilon mu alpha omega h one over f hat theta one over epsilon minus one minus one. So this is our second uh, second equation here. So what are its properties? So we know that f hat of theta is strictly increasing in theta. One over f hat of theta is going to be uh, strictly decreasing. Then you put it to the power of one epsilon minus one, that's still strictly decreasing. And then you put it through tau minus one, which is strictly increasing. So that's going to be strictly decreasing. So we know that xp is um, strictly decreasing in theta. Okay, so we know that at theta equals zero, uh, f hat of theta is zero, so one over f hat of theta is infinite. So everything that's in the bracket is infinite, and tau minus the inverse of tau minus of uh, tau minus one of infinity. That's uh, that's just going to be x m. That's because tau of x m is plus infinity. Uh, so basically, when theta is equal to zero, x is just equal to x m. And then after that, uh, x is of course going to be decreasing. Then, the, so what happens when uh, So what happens when theta goes to infinity? When theta goes to infinity, f hat goes to one. And so what's inside the bracket is going to converge to something. If that something is positive, then it means that uh, tau, you know, tau minus one of that something positive would be something positive. So x will have a positive asymptote. If that something has become negative at some point, it means that there is a maximum, you know, so it means that uh, we cannot invert it through tau, so it means that there'll be some kind of uh, maximum theta, and that maximum theta would be the theta such that what's inside the bracket here is just equal to zero, and at that point, uh, xp is going to be equal to zero. Okay. Um, so in a sense, there are two situations. Uh, and it all depends. Uh, it depends on whether key epsilon mu alpha w h one over epsilon minus one minus one is positive or negative. I'm trying to see whether we can figure that out, but I don't think we know. Yeah, I don't think we can tell whether they'll be positive or negative, but the thing is that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter at all, in fact, for the solution. So situation one is that, uh, so situation one is that key epsilon mu alpha W over H, one over epsilon minus one minus one positive. Then what we know is that the limit of X P of theta when theta goes to infinity is going to be <clears throat> some X that we can call um, X P such that uh, Tau of xp is equal to uh, so let's you know I'm not going to carry that around everywhere. Let's call this thing here. Let's call it uh, lambda. 
which I think is some parameters that we haven't used. Uh, so then tau of xp is equal to lambda or if you want xp, the, the horizontal asymptote is going to be tau minus one of lambda. Other situation is lambda is strictly uh, negative. Uh, and in that case, then there is a theta p such that key uh, epsilon nu alpha w h one over f hat of theta p one over epsilon minus one is equal to one. We know that because that uh, you know, that function is uh, strictly decreasing. So this is f hat of theta p basically uh, is equal to the epsilon u alpha w h. So basically, it all depends on uh, what happens to this thing. If this thing is, uh, it all depends whether this is uh, bigger than one or less than one, actually. Um, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's actually the crux. Uh, all the conditions, so in fact, this is, this is what you should call lambda. And it all depends whether this is uh, whether this is bigger than one or less than one. So this condition that we have here being bigger than zero, uh, this one this is equivalent to having what I call lambda here. Is equivalent to having lambda here uh, bigger than one. Yes, and then the second condition here, this is lambda less than zero. So this, in fact, I should rewrite it as lambda uh, less than one. Right, so we define lambda as this thing, k epsilon mu alpha divided by wh. If it's right, if this lambda is greater than one, then oh god, like the notation is a mess here. Yeah. Uh, so tau xp in that case is going to be now that defined lambda as follows one over epsilon minus one minus one. And then xp is going to be lambda one over epsilon minus one, which is bigger than one minus one. Okay. Second condition lambda less than one. Oh. Then there's theta p such that we have this, and so basically f, and so basically the theta p that we are looking at here, it's f hat inverted of lambda. Whew, okay, so we have theta p inverted of lambda. Uh, at that thing, then x p of theta p uh, right, fp of theta p is going to be tau minus one of zero, and that's going to be equal to zero, right? Uh, so either the curve xp becomes zero at some finite tightness called theta p, which is given by f 
uh, f minus 1 of lambda or, uh, or it asymptotes some xp that's equal to this. And, and yeah, and it all depends whether uh, what we call lambda is more than one or less than one. Uh, so in, let me show you that in the graph because I could imagine that you'll be confused here. Uh, right, so here's what we showed. So here I can plot the model solution. Right, so we said that when theta equals zero, what we've just showed is that theta equals zero, xp of zero is just xm. So here we have xm. Then we know that this xp curve is strictly decreasing and we know that there are two situations. Either we have a horizontal asymptote at some level and that level of the horizontal asymptote is tau minus one of lambda one over epsilon minus one minus one. So here we have tau minus one of lambda one over epsilon minus one minus one. And so this is when, of course, lambda has to be strictly greater than one for this thing to exist, where lambda, lambda is this key epsilon mu alpha w divided by h. And so in that case, xp, the xp curve is going to look something like this. That's xp of theta. And so here we see one strictly increasing, one strictly decreasing um, you know, clearly they are going to cross, in that case they are going to cross once and only once between zero and, uh, and theta l. And so here we know that between zero and theta, there'll be an intersection of these two curves, which will give theta and which will give x. And that will be our model solution. Second situation is when lambda is uh, less than one. And so when lambda is less than one, what we said is that uh, the second curve here is going to be strictly decreasing and is going to be zero at some level here. And this level here, where uh, the curve is zero, is we said f hat minus one of lambda. And this intersection exists when lambda is strictly less than one. Uh, Okay, and in that case, of course, then we know that the two curves, again, will have an intersection here, a model solution. Which will also be between zero and theta, but in fact, more than that, we know that it'll be between this zero and this theta, uh, this, uh, between zero and theta L, but in fact, it'll be in that case, between zero and this theta P, which is, uh, well, you know, between zero and theta p, but th actually there is no guarantee that theta p is less than theta l. So it'll be between zero and the mean of theta p and theta l. But anyway, it'll always exist, which is uh, what we care about here. So here we found, and you know, you have to be careful because you have these two cases here. Um, but we found that this, uh, we found that there is always a solution, and the solution is uh, unique. which was uh, what we were after here.